Today in John Wesley's Journal is a podcast produced by the Wesley Center at Chattanooga, the United Methodist Student Center. In this podcast, we will learn about early Methodism by following John Wesley through his journal as he and others begin a movement that would give rise to the Methodist Church in all its forms. So sit back and let's see what happened today in John Wesley's journal. Welcome to Today in John Wesley's Journal for today, December 18th, 1735. But before we get to John Wesley's Journal, let's look at some other things that happened on this day in church history. On this day in 1666, Scottish minister Hugh McCall, and by the way, there are several different spellings for his last name if you want to look up more information on him, just be warned, is condemned to death when he resists the king's claims of authority over the Church of Scotland. Dorothy Sayers passed away on this day in 1957. Sayers was an important English author in her own right, but she is remembered as being one of those few who formed the extended circle of friends known as the Inklings, along with J.R.R. Tolkien, Owen Barfield, and C.S. Lewis. Lewis thought highly of Sayers' work, quoting her book on human creativity in his book, Miracles. Here is the reference. How a miracle can be no inconsistency, but the highest consistency, will be clear to those who have read Miss Dorothy Sayers' indispensable book, The Mind of the Maker. Miss Sayers' thesis is based on the analogy between God's relation to the world on the one hand, and an author's relation to his book on the other. If you are writing a story, miracles or abnormal events may be bad art, or they may not, If, for example, you are writing an ordinary, realistic novel and have got your characters into a hopeless muddle, it would be quite intolerable if you suddenly cut the knot and secured a happy ending by having a fortune left to the hero from an unexpected quarter. On the other hand, there is nothing against taking as your subject, from the outset, the adventures of a man who inherits an unexpected fortune. The unusual event is perfectly permissible if it is what you are really writing about. It is an artistic crime if you simply drag it in by the heels to get yourself out of a hole. Now there is no doubt that a great deal of modern objection to miracles is based on the suspicion that they are marvels of the wrong sort, that a story of a certain kind, nature, is arbitrarily interfered with to get the characters out of a difficulty by events that do not really belong to that kind of story. Some people probably think of the resurrection as a desperate last-moment expedient to save the hero from a situation which had got out of the author's control. The reader may set his mind at rest. If I thought miracles were like that, I should not believe in them. If they have occurred, they have occurred because they are the very thing this universal story is about. And earlier this week, on December 17, 1743, Publishers finally finished printing the first run of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. It goes on sale two days later, instantly becoming a Christmas, a Christmas classic, but we'll have more on that later. The Moravian Church in southwest Tanzania holds its first synod on the 17th of December, 1976. And on the 16th of December, Betsy Ten Boom dies in Nazi captivity at the concentration camp called Ravensbrück where she and her sister had been imprisoned for aiding Dutch Jews who were hiding from their German occupiers. Her sister, Corrie ten Boom, recounts her sister's faith and strength in Christ in her book, The Hiding Place. Here, Corrie remembers the moments after her sister's death from long illness and imprisonment. I raised my eyes to Betsy's face. Lord Jesus, what have you done? What are you saying? What are you giving me? For there lay Betsy, her eyes closed in sleep, her face full and young. The care lines, the grief lines, the deep hollow of hunger and disease were simply gone. In front of me was the Betsy of Harlem, happy and at peace, stronger, freer. This was the Betsy of heaven. I looked once more at the radiant face of my sister. A pile of clothes was heaped outside in the hallway, On top was Nolly's blue sweater. I stooped to pick it up. The sweater was threadbare and stained with newsprint, but it was a tangible link with Betsy. Mien seized my arm. 
Don't touch those things. Black lice. They'll all be burned. And so I left behind the last physical tie. It was better. Now what tied me to Betsy was the hope of heaven. The first ten amendments to a new U.S. Constitution are ratified on December 15, 1791, including the first one, which says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Also on the 15th of December, Count Zinzendorf, as a bishop of the Moravian Church, ordains Peter Bowler. Bowler, Zinzendorf, and the Moravian Church all play an important role in the life of John and Charles Wesley, and so, consequently, Methodism in general. Bowler especially would play a pivotal role in John Wesley's life after his return to England. Having first met Bowler on March 7, 1738, Wesley would mark his departure for the Carolinas on May 4, 1738, with these words. Peter Bowler left London in order to embark for Carolina. Oh, what a work hath God begun since his coming to England, such a one as shall never come to an end until heaven and earth pass away. And African American Methodists from eight local ME South conferences gather in Jackson, Tennessee to organize the Colored Methodist Episcopal Church, now called the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. The CMA, CME is the third of three great Methodist denominations organized by African Americans. The CME grew out of a plan of separation organized by the Methodist Episcopal Church South during its quadrennium of 1866 to 1870. The plan was in response to the growing numbers of African American members who felt they had no part in the ME South, which itself had separated from the Methodist Episcopal Church over the issue of slavery. The CME, under the leadership of its earliest bishops, would go on to grow and prosper in its work of glorying in the cross. The denomination would eventually found and support institutions such as Phillips School of Theology, Lane College, Miles College, and Texas College. And on December 14, 1906, Elizabeth Evelyn Wright passes away after years of personal sacrifice for the sake of her vocation and vision. Born the child of former slaves, she would overcome many hardships and shortcomings in her early education. Wright eventually becomes a student of the Tuskegee School, where her Christian faith leads her to take the hard-fought lessons of that institution and apply them to the founding of a new school in South Carolina. This school would go on to become the Voorhees Industrial School, now Voorhees College. And now today in John Wesley's journal for today, December 18th, 1735. One who was big with child, in a high fever, and almost wasted away with a violent cough, desired to receive the Holy Communion before she died. At the hour of her receiving, she began to recover, and in a few days was entirely out of danger. And now we return to our time. But we will be back on December 21st for another entry from John Wesley's journal. Have a good day.